So then I think we could move to uh, Professor uh, Vassal, Gilles Vassal from France. Uh, he's a professor of oncology, University Paris-Saclay, head of the pediatric research program, Gustave Roussy Comprehensive Cancer Center. He's also chair of ITCC and Accelerate. And he's a past president of the European Society of Pediatric Oncology and known to many of you in the, audi in the audience. And he will speak on uh, Temosulomid uh, to the WHO Essentialist for Children. So uh, very welcome, Professor Vassal. Thank you very much, Bente. Uh, and thank you to the organizer for really inviting me to this very important forum. I'm very pleased to be here, share a few of the things we've been doing and contribute to make things better for children and adolescents with cancer. So, uh, um, uh, Gevo Tamanian uh, uh, asked me whether I could share with you one example of an essential medicine that is currently proposed to be uh, uh, added to the essential medicine list for children, and this drug is temozolomide. And I would like to do in the next few day, few few minutes, is to share with you why and what is the reason. On the next slide, as you all know, the essential medicine list for children, which is in the ninth edition, released in 2023, is an extremely important document, as already illustrated by all the uh, initiative on the GICC global platform, but also in Europe, for example, at the time we are addressing the issue of shortages for critical medicine. So this list is very important, is revived every two years, and it is important that it is continuously improved to better address the needs of children and adolescents with cancer. If we look at the 2023 list, there are 361 medicines and 40 of them are for the treatment of cancer in children. And this list is only for children up to 12 years. And these medicines are excitotoxic agents, targeted therapies, immunomodulators, hormone anti-hormones, and supportive cares. And for each of the medicine, the list is giving what are the available formulation and strengths, and what are the indications? On the next slide, since 2020, we have been uh, uh, proposing modification to make these essential medicines for children, the cancer list, more uh, um, even better to better address the needs of children. So we started with the SIOP Europe essential medicine teams, and since 2024, we are working as well with the SIOP essential medicine working group, really to provide all the information, evidence for the cancer medicine group at WHO uh, to define whether or not a new medicine or an, 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 an medicine or indication should be joining the AMLC. And when we compare at the moment the uh, list in 2019 and the list in 2023, there has been clearly uh, an augmentation of the information, expansion of indications for 10 cytotoxic agents, addition of three indications, low-grade glioma, which is one of the six the, uh, GICC index cancer, lung eros histiocytosis and anaplastic large cell lymphoma, and Two medicines, namely vinorelbin and verolimus, have been added to this list for children. On the next slide. So, in the, the, oops, in the previous one, the, currently this is the revision of the 2023 uh, list that will be released in probably in the next few months, probably during summer. And clearly, we have made a proposal to introduce temozolomide for the treatment of high-grade glioma, Ewing sarcoma, neuroblastoma, and for palliative care, as well as um, neuroblastoma and Ewing sarcoma. Why? Because temozolomide is used in these disease in combination with irinotecan, um, which is very important because this is the way we are using this at the moment. So on the next slide, why temozolomide is an essential medicine for childhood cancer? 
On the next slide, temozolomide is a very old cytotoxic agent, classical cytotoxic chemotherapy. This is an alkylating agent, and you can see on the screen that it is a, a medicine spontaneously degraded into MTIC under pH, uh, um, normal physiological pH. And this is this medicine, which is alkylating, generating alteration at the DNA level. And when these alterations are accumulated, then the, cell, the, cells die, the cells die. On the next slide. And what is important is that this drug introduce a methyl group on one of the base of, base of the uh, uh, DNA base, guanine. And this is important to understand that this base is no longer a normal base. And there is a mismatch which at the moment, if it's not uh, um, suppressed, will generate it all the consequences in terms of uh, um, uh, uh, cytotoxicity of the cells. And this is important because this is the way the medicine works. And there are uh, intrinsic biological processes in the cells which are responsible for resistance to this drug. And this is this enzyme, MGMT, for methylguanine methyltransferase, which is taking the methyl uh, group from the guanine to make the guanine normal again. So it was a little bit complex, but to share that it is a very well-known drug in the way it works, accumulation of lesion linked to alteration of the DNA generates cytotoxicity of the cells. On the next slide. It's indeed an old drug. The first approval in Europe and in the US was in 1999. And at that time, there was a company named Sharing Claw who did put forward this marketing authorization. And the treatment is, was, and still is five days a week, every four weeks. And what is interesting is that in the EU, the indication was glioblastoma with radiation therapy, newly diagnosed in adults, and including from the beginning, the treatment of children beyond the three years of age, as well as an adolescent with relapsed or recurrent hygroglioma. And this is different from what it was in the U.S. In the U.S., the indication was for newly diagnosed glioblastoma in adults with radiotherapy, refractory anaplastic uh, 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 astrocytoma in adults, but the indication specify that pediatric use, safety, and effectiveness as a, have not been established in pediatric patients. And interestingly, these indications in 1999 are very much now still the indication in the US and Europe regarding the drug. But as you know, pediatric oncologists do not really um, uh, consider only the drug which are approved in an indication, but use the drug in the pharmacy and develop clinical trials to figure out how to continue to improve children, uh, the, the, the survival of children with cancer. And on the next slide, at the moment, where are we? The rationale for all this uh, evaluation in hybrid glioma was very much from the so-called STOOP regimen, which is important because it, it gave the basis of the rationale of using this drug in hybrid glioma. This was an EORTC trial comparing temozolomide plus radiotherapy versus radiotherapy in patient operated, adult patient operated from a glioblastoma. And as you can see, there is a significant approval in progression-free survival, even though no patient were cured. And this was very much the basis of the use in standard of care in adults and extrapolated in children over the last years and still now. On the next slide. So if we look at what is the situation at the moment of this medicine, after clinical trials in, in Europe, in, in North America, and other places of the country studying temozolomides, single agent, and most of the time combination for the treatment of children with cancer. And you will see that it's a very well-used drug for hybrid glioma, including DIPG with radiation therapy in standard of care, 
for the treatment of patients with a relapsed refractory neuroblastoma in combination with uh, a class of compound called topo-1 inhibitors, irinotecan, topotecan, and even more recently, a monoclonal antibody against anti-GD2 has been added to this combination and clearly define a better response rate for children in relapse of neuroblastoma. And this became a first standard treatment of relapse of this patient. The drug is also used in Ewing sarcoma, and of course the drug is used as monotherapy, because why? It is well tolerated, it can be given orally because it's an oral drug, the IV form is not very much used, and can be used in patients to uh, control the disease at the time there is no more curative treatment. I will not go into the detail, just give you one example, which is uh, on the next slide which is uh, uh, the combination of temozolomide, irinotica, dinutuximab, so chemoimmunotherapy, an immunotherapy and a combination regimen. And as you can see on this slide, in this patient with a refractory relapse neur iris neuroblastoma with a probability of cure extremely low, the response rate is high, 40%, with clearly a probability of overall survival more than 40%. So showing that this drug in combination is important for the treatment of these patients. On the next slide. So in terms of toxicity, the drug is very well tolerated. It's only an hematological toxicity, leukemia, platelet, anemia, that uh, can be done uh, in outpatient uh, with just a uh, uh, blood count uh, 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 regularly just to monitor the dose. So very well tolerated drugs. On the next slide, it's also a drug, since it is old, with a lot of generics. You have the list here of all the generics in each of the different countries. So the drug is widely available, uh, um, um, even though it's not prescribed or uh, indicated for childhood, uh, for children uh, with cancer. And on the next slide, and in addition, I told you that the uh, uh, um, indication in Europe is above three years of age because clearly at the time of the, of the evaluation, there was no appropriate formulation for children below three years of age. And very important, the GAP-F uh, uh, initiative at the OMS have been looking at pediatric drug optimization for cancer medicine, looking at which medicine would need effort to formulate and develop um, uh, appropriate formulation for oral use in children. As you can see on this slide, temozolomide has been identified by GAPF slash OMS as a drug on which effort to, de to develop and make available a pediatric formulation of temozolomide uh, should be done in the next year. So clearly, demonstrating with all this, the drug is largely used, the drug is efficient, uh, we're very well tolerated on the next slide, and clearly with the need of a new formulation. So I hope I convince you that the importance of this drug to make this available on the essential medicine list for children would really help uh, all uh, pediatric oncologists and government to consider that this medicine is absolutely important for me. Uh, as a conclusion, and on the next slide, I would like to thank the uh, SIOP Europe Essential Medicine Team, composed of young pediatric oncologists who are really engaged on working on this essential medicine initiative, access to medicine, which is very important at the time, all over, uh, all over the globe in Europe as well. Uh, Kira Sheehan from SIOP Europe, who was absolutely um, uh, instrumental for really put this forward, and also the SIOP International Essential Medicine Working Group, and you see the list with uh, pediatric oncologists, pharmacists, and patient advocates from all the continent, all the SIOP International uh, 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 continent, uh, uh, really working together. And this is all these people who did put forward this application of temozolomide to the WHO essential medicine list. And we are at the moment waiting for the final decision um, uh, that will probably be available in the next few months. So I hope it was, uh, it was useful uh, to show really how the process is and the importance, the importance to continuously look at what are 
the medicine, the old one that should be there, the new one which are coming, because binatumumab is extremely important, but the drug is still protected and very expensive. So there is some specific measures needed for a drug from plimatumumab, which may be a little more difficult as compared to temozolomide. We're clearly showing this is important, will help children to have access to this medicine. I hope this was useful, and I thank you for your intention. Professor uh, Vassal, and um, I, I especially thank you because you highlighted what it takes to either introduce new medicines or to change indications. And uh, I think the whole society is very grateful for SIOP Europe, the working group, and also the support from the working group uh, at SIOP International. And I think what you're uh, emphasizing, even if you didn't so, sort of tell a lot about that, is the importance to get uh, a, a medicine on the essential medicine list. And I think that is, uh, and this is also an opportunity for me to say that if there are any in the audience that think that we are talking about things that, that you have never heard of, things that you don't understand, or you have a critical question, please put your um, question or comment in the chat. There is a chat open uh, as well. So thank you very much I'm for sure, your work. If, yes, if I may just add something, I just want to yes. mention that the team WHO Essential medicine is really an excellent team. And working with WHO, working with this team is absolutely great. And the way over the last five years we have been doing that really illustrates how committed is the WHO and this team really to make this essential medicine fit for purpose. Thank you. Thank you very much for mentioning them. And I couldn't agree more. And at the moment, I'm less biased than before because now I am with St. Jude's, as most of you know, as a director of global engagement strategies. But I came from a position as an NCD director uh, at WHO. And you also mentioned another branch, I would say, of uh, WHO, uh, and that is the GAPF which has been very useful and a very good instrument to uh, explore uh, how we can manage uh, pediatric uh, formulations in a very systematic way. So again, thanks a lot. Mm -hmm.